I do appreciate the opportunity. I am low man on the totem pole. That is Pastor Brown, and that is Pastor Butler, and I'm just Brother Stewart. So, it is an honor. No, seriously, I am just I'm not even ordained. Isaiah 64. If you turn there, Isaiah 64, we'll get right into it. It's good to be here. It's good to be back. It's good to be back amongst family and friends. I do love, I do love Berean. All right, Isaiah chapter 64. We'll read, and we'll get into it. Real simple. But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father, we are the clay, and Thou our potter, and we are all the work of Thy hand. Father, we thank You for this morning. We thank You for the uh, privilege it was to get out of bed and to uh, be given life today and grant the opportunity to be a vessel uh, fit for the Master's use. I pray You would find us usable and worthy, Father, of Your service. Now, we thank you for this uh, group here that has come and given of their time this morning, Lord. This is your hour. And Lord, I pray you'd speak to their hearts now in a mighty way. And uh, Lord, we'll give you the praise and glory for it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So we just got back from a road trip. It was a great road trip. I uh, went down to Tennessee, out to Virginia. Uh, as a family, it was just a really good road trip. It was a great time uh, for us together, but it was also great to see family and friends. Uh, Jaden learned how to potty train on this trip which was a shock and surprising. I didn't think it was going to go that well, but he did. He also learned how to swim. So it really was a productive trip on that aspect. Uh, Jay Jasmine got to spend some quality time with her grandmother and her cousins and aunties and uncles and making memories and strengthening bonds. And uh, we've been saying this for several years now. That this, is, this is our last one, and then we're going to be out of here and gone for good. And, you know, each birthday we're going to make it a big one because it might be the last one and the last Christmas. And here we are still, missionaries to Hastings. Amen. But, uh, but not only was the trip good, and, and we, I wasn't sure how it was going to start off because we didn't get to the bottom of the driveway in Welch. Um, we hadn't made it a quarter of a mile, and Jaden says, I got to go potty. So <laughs> that continued for the next hours proceeding that Jaden did a lot of pit stops along the side of the road. Um, Jaden also decided while in the pool that he was going to leap into the pool unsupervised by any of us. And there wasn't a parent within 15 feet. I'm at the other end of the pool playing with my nephew. Uh, my sister's over here taking care of the newborn. The wife is sitting in a chair uh, and Jaden jumps in. And I turn around and I hear it and he's already been face down for multiple seconds. And I just was swimming all I had. I said, somebody jump and get him. Renee leaps up ninja style and dives in and saves our son. So praise the Lord for that. That was a blessing. Uh, my heart rate was up for a while. And I also had the opportunity to speak into uh, United Methodist Church. And not only one, but two United Methodist Church on the same Sunday. So that was an honor and a blessing. Um, it was a great trip. Uh, but also on the trip, I had the opportunity to spend some time in a potter shop on a potter's wheel. Um, my sister um, has spent some time there herself, got to know the potter there and built a really good rapport. She has free range of the potter shop and access to the clay and the kilns and anything she wants. And my niece is now an, uh, an artist uh, st and student artist in New York and has spent some time in the potter shop and had asked me to come, would I ever? So we got an opportunity. Jasmine and I went down one day and then I went back down with Jasmine again another day and spent two days. And having now closely and in detail watched the process and having had the opportunity to, to throw some clay, as they call it, I've gotten a new appreciation. Uh, I've learned the work, the mastery, and the skill that goes into making a cup, a bowl, a vase, you name it, whatever comes off that pottery's wheel. It is remarkable the amount of work and effort and mastery that goes into it. Uh, the marvelous transformation that takes place is remarkable from and I didn't see all the, on, the beginning process, but I know it is quite a process of extracting the clay from the earth and separating it, purifying it, making it usable and moldable and pliable. And then, then the whole process of wedging it and ridding it of all the air and then the wheel process. And then there's the kiln process, the firing, the glazing. I mean, it is just a remarkable transformation that goes from the earth to the showcase. And I got a new appreciation for that. And I learned it's not just dirt. It's much more than just clay and dirt. And now when I see a handmade bowl or a handmade plate or, or a vase or whatever, I see more than just the finish that the product reveals. I see the skill and the work that went into it. Amen. Now I'm no potter. By no stretch of the imagination am I a potter. But I am certainly clay. Yeah. 
and I related an awful lot to that clay on that wheel. And that's what I want to talk about this morning as we read in Isaiah 64, verse 8. I am the clay. You are the clay. We are clay. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, thou art potter, and we are all the work of thy hand. See, the master potter is continually throwing pottery. He is continually throwing clay. The word throw means to twist, to turn, also called turning. Turning one form or thing into another, transforming. And the master potter is continually, constantly doing this throwing process. He has constantly got clay on the wheel by which he is throwing it, turning it, transforming it into something. Now, clay that is pliable and moldable, willing to be fashioned under the potter's hand, is clay which is willing to become whatever the potter wills it to become. See, the potter is going to will that piece of clay to become something. But the, the clay has to be moldable and pliable and willing to be able to do that. And if the clay is willing to do that, it will become the precise vessel the potter wishes it to be. The potter already has envisioned in his mind and in his heart when he sees that lump of clay, what he wants that lump of clay to become. He's already got it planned out. He already knows what he's going to do, but the clay must be pliable and moldable. And if it will, it will become the precise vessel. It will also perform the exact purpose it was intended to. You and I are clay. We must be pliable. We must be moldable. We must be willing. Turn with me, if you would, in Jeremiah chapter 18. We'll read a few verses here, and then we'll get into it. Now, this is a totally different... Um, this is different. I've never used the slide things before. I've never presented a, a message in this context like this. I don't even have an outline. We're just going with it. Uh, so praise the Lord. Something may come out of it, and I hope it does, because this is his hour. This is his message, and I know you came here to hear something. So let us read here in Jeremiah 18, and we'll read for a little bit. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. Now the wheels there in context is different than the wheels. Today, I just when I was there, I operated a pedal. Uh, elect, uh, 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 charged by electricity, right? But they didn't have that. So they had one wheel on the bottom by which the potter turned, and then they had the wheel up top, which actually turned the clay. So when he says wheels in plural, there's two wheels going on. The one he's turning with his foot, and then the one on the top, okay? And where was I? Verse 4. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Saith the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. And it goes on in for sake of time. Um, I do have in here to read down, but we won't. And I want to take a different, my, my point today is not talking about the marred clay. The context is dealing with Jerusalem, Israel, a, a apostate, reprobate, um, fallen nation. And God is trying to get a hold of them and trying to get them back into the fold and trying to get that clay workable and performing to the vessel by which it was intended to perform. And and in Jeremiah here, he introduces the potter and the clay. He introduces the marred vessel that was remade. Verses 5 and 6 talk about the warning, the proclamation um, that is to come if they do not. It talks about pushing and pulling and plucking up and destroying. It talks about being a vessel of honor and dishonor. And it talks about how he can either, they can either experience God's grace or they can feel God's wrath, depending upon what they are willing to or not to do. This chapter is about a, a master potter, a piece of clay, and the clay's moldability. And that's what I want to focus on this morning, is the moldability of us, of you. Pliability, right? We are clay. Behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. I also am formed out of the clay. Those are the words of Job in Job chapter 33, verse 6. And Adam knows, as we know, Adam was formed out of the dust of the ground. He was made out of clay, right? Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. We are clay. Amen. Now, I didn't go and look at all the DNA, and I've heard that there's quite a, a number of comparisons. The percentage is 90 some percent of, of us in the ground. And, and what those numbers are exactly, I should have looked them up. I didn't. But our, our, our makeup is that of dirt, okay? Um, so, 
Job realizes what he is. Adam knew what he was. It would do us some real good to remember what we are and what we are here for this morning. You and I are clay. Just a lump of clay. Clay for the master's creating, though. Not for my own, not for my own use, but for his. A lump of clay unearthed with the intent of becoming a useful and honorable vessel. Now, vessels and pots, I noticed this after walking through the pottery shop. And I noticed this before, I already knew this. But each one is unique. It is original. It is its own. It is unlike any other. It is specific. The, the master potter there, his name is Alan. Alan had thrown all kinds of bowls and plates and cups. And although they looked so much similar, and although he had such a technique down that he could master these nacho bowls where it has the, the sauce and then the chips go around it and it's one solid piece of clay. He would form the inner, then he would spread it out and he would form the outer and it's one. And even though they all looked the same, if you looked closely, you noticed each one was different. Each one was unique. Each one was Specific, And then the handles, especially, you notice the handles on the cups, how, man, they look so similar, but yet, look closely, each one was different. Each pot is peculiar, produced from the potter's hand for a particular purpose, for the potter's purpose. That was the purpose of the pot. Each vessel requires and begins with three things, a master potter, a piece of clay, and a powered wheel, right? Because not, no pot ever just evolved, no pot just of its own became something. It was created by a creator. No lump of clay ever left alone ever just became a usable vessel. Nothing ever just came out of the earth. A lump of clay never came out and became a drinking cup. Someone had to work at it, go through the process of unearthing it and all that that we have spoken of, turning it, firing it, glazing it, so on and so forth. Then it became a vessel usable. And the process that each and every pot clay must pass through on the wheel are these things. And as I was watching my, my niece and my sister go through this, I'm writing these, jotting these notes down. And I said, someday there's a sermon coming out of this. I did not know it was going to come so quickly. But this is kind of it. Oh, uh, yeah. Like I said, I'm, I'm not familiar with the slide thing. This is new to me. I'm already late on the draw. There, Master Potter, a lump of clay, uh, power, purpose, and pliability. Here we go. Number one. <laughs> Whew. Should have kept that thing up here so I knew it was coming. Number one, I just, there we go, anchor. The first thing that must happen is the anchoring process. This is a dual process. It is both the clay and the potter. So first, the wheel is there. The, the, the potter takes his lump of clay, usually a pound or two pound, which is measured and cut precisely, and he finds the center of that thing, right, Jasmine? And he takes that thing and he goes, wham! And he tries to slam that piece of pottery down to the center of that wheel as closely as he possibly can to anchor it down. In order for it to be slapped down, uh, it also has to be a clean slate. That plate has got to be completely clean and removed of all other past clay and, and, and particles, and it must be dry. So it must have a clean slate by which it can be anchored to. Amen? And not only that, but the potter itself, the potterer must be anchored. As you can see him there and all three of them, especially the guy on the end with the hat. He is really bearing down on that thing because the next step is the most crucial and vital step of them all. But in order for him to be able to do what is to follow, he must have that wheel right between him close. He must have his legs anchored. His legs must be solid. His arms have got to be braced against his leg and his core has got to be tight. Because what's about to happen next is going to define what the rest of the pot looks like. So not only is the clay need to be pottered, but the potter needs to be anchored. Not only is the clay need to be anchored, but the potter needs to be anchored. Step one. I thought, that is so interesting. And then, this is the centering process. This is the second stage. My little boy had the opportunity to watch his cousin, his sister, and myself go before him. And that boy jumps up on that wheel like he'd been doing it his whole life. And immediately began on centering the clay. In order to be able to work a bowl or a cup, you must center it first. So it has been anchored, the potter is anchored, now comes the centering process. This process requires the most intense pressure and most intense speed of all the process. Okay? What he's going to do is he's going to take his hand, and as you see him, he's going to Wedge it right on top of that thing. And this hand is now going to support because what he's doing is he's 
pushing down on that clay and trying to get it centered on that wheel and bringing it all tightly together. And the one way you can tell is as you start to feel it centering, you take your hands and you just lightly touch it. And when you do, you feel this even smooth process running around as the wheel is just turning as fast as it can. And if you feel it wobbling, then you've got to continue centering. And it's going to require core, arm, leg, pressure. Awful lots of pressure. Because an unbalanced piece of clay equals a warped vessel. And you can't work with a warped vessel. So it must be anchored and it must be centered. In all of these, you can, you can make these applicable. And that's what this message is. It is so applicable and so practical. But you, you can take the anchoring and you can apply that to you. You can take the centering and you can apply that to you. You know what the scripture saith. You know what you need to do. You need to be centered. How do you get anchored? The Word of God. The Holy Spirit. How do you get centered? You get into the book. Right? You get into prayer. Okay? Moving on. The next process is the hole. Now this is where you get to puncture and pull. So now you've got your centered wedge. You've got your centered... It's starting to take a little bit of shape. But now, now you start to get a little bit physical with it. And you're going to stab it. You're going to poke your finger down in that thing. This is my, my nephew, uh, Caleb, here. He punctures and pulls, and what it does is it opens up and exposes the inward. It shows what's on the inside of that clay, because that's where almost all of the work is now going to take place, is on the inside of that pot. But in order to do that, it's going to take some puncturing and some pulling. So you find the center, you puncture down, and then you pull. But you slow down the wheel at this process. The pressure is now going to be even and delicate. And you're going to feel the lumps in the clay. And you're going to feel what needs to be worked on, what needs to be done. And we're going to get into that process in just a second. But it's going to be exposed. The inward is going to be exposed. Because the next process is this process called the lifting. Now the clay must begin to form something. In order for it to do that, you lift it. And this means the pressure comes from the outside. So you have all this pressure on the outside, which isn't, it's, again, it's a delicate pressure, but it's still enough pressure while the inward hand is just supporting that. And you're using your fingers and you're almost pressing that clay in between those two fingers and you're trying to lift it up. So you're grabbing down towards the bottom where all that clay is and then you lift it up. And as you're lifting, you feel, oh, that's a little bit heavy right there and you lift that a little bit higher. All the pressure coming from the outside. But there is always a supported hand on the inside. And that is how you lift it. But then there's also the stretching process. And this is where you make bowls and plates. Is you have to stretch it. So the pressure from the outside will lift it. But the pressure from the inside will stretch it. And again, it's, it's a little bit heavy pressure. But nothing like centering it. And again... There is always a hand supporting. Working in unison with the pressure hand is a supportive hand. One on the inside, one on the outside. From anchoring, which is the first step we saw, to the cutting, which is a process by which you then take that cable and you cut that, that clay from off that wheel, there is one thing that is consistent always, and I beat myself to the punchline, it is pressure. There is always pressure from the time that that thing is anchored and slapped down onto that wheel to the moment that it is finally cut free of that wheel. There is constantly pressure being applied in some level, from some angle, from some side. From every angle, from every side, inward, outward, pushing, pulling, poking, prodding. But the result is one well worth it. See, the clay doesn't realize that. The clay just feels like it's being pushed around and pulled around and lifted and stretched. It's not really sure what exactly is happening. It feels a little intense at some points, and then it's a little bit milder at others. And then there's always water being splashed on it. Not really sure what's going on there. But if you don't get water on the wheel, what happens, Jasmine? You get burnt up. Both the clay and the potter. It's got to be moisture constantly on that thing. And that pressure is the right amount at the right time coming from the right hands, even though it may not feel like it. You can't always tell. You can't always uh, see what is happening. As you're on the wheel, you're very self-focused, and, uh, and that's okay. 
Because you're a vessel being made for a purpose. For a specific purpose. And we need to figure out what our purpose is. See, when you, if you got the wrong kind of pressure, like I said, you'll end up with a wobbly vessel. As you can see there, you got some, uh, can, I, can I use a pointer? Oh, yeah, there we go. So you got a little air gap right down in there. You can see where it's caved in there. It's super thin right there. It got a little thin in this section, and that wobbled out. It's got to have even pressure. Because if you do, same potter made this piece of clay. Just two different outcomes. This is a perfectly centered, perfectly balanced, perfectly stretched and lifted uh, piece of clay that in the end was given a little extra love and attention. Jasmine made that into a heart bowl. Same potter, just different pressure. Now, we will learn this in our, in our, in our time on the wheel, that our faith will be stretched and lifted. Amen. It will be tested and tried. Amen. And in doing so, it will be grown and strengthened. But at the time, it did not feel like such, it did not seem like such, it did not appear as such. But it is such. And our patience will be stretched and lifted. And it will be tested and tried. And in doing so, patience will have been learned and attained. But not only there, hope will also be stretched and lifted. Amen. And hope will be tested and tried. Is there not some times that your hope has been tested and tried? The things that you once felt absolute certain about, had all surety of, has sometimes been tested and tried and had you doubting and wondering and contemplating. But in doing so, your hope is also gotten and manifested. The pressure, the tribulation, the firing, the high heat, all of that is inevitable. In order for a clay to be what it's supposed to be, in order for a clay pot to be produced, these things have got to happen. But not only are they inevitable, more importantly, they are absolutely necessary. The pot cannot exist without it. Now, we have taken those pots home. I think both of them. Um, yes, we took both of those pots home. We're keeping them both. And, uh, but it's not done. We still have to make our own home-built kiln, and we have to try and heat those up. Because if they don't get heated, they're not usable. They look pretty cool. They're good-looking bowls. But if they're not heated and food grade tested or, or food grade products put on them that they can be used as such, then they are purposeless and they serve no purpose whatsoever. They must go through each and every process. The vessel cannot function fully and most gloriously for his glory without it. And that is the purpose of the vessel. That is what Jeremiah was trying to get to, get at with Israel. Listen, Israel, it's not about you. You don't exist for you. You're not here for you. You are here for him. And you must be a vessel fit for him to be used by him because that is your purpose for being here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, if you would. This is going to be a super short message. You guys are going to be out of here super fast today. You're going to be like, do this more often, brothers, do right? First Thessalonians chapter 3. And I have 3 and 4 up there. Boom. But let's go ahead and read down. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. And sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Here it is. That no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. We're appointed to experience some pressure. We're appointed to experience some suffering. We're appointed to experience some tribulation. And tribulation worketh what? Patience. And patience, experience. And experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed. 
Hope enables that vessel to sit out on that showcase cabinet or shelf or whatever in all its glory to be able to manifest unto others its beauty and perfection and purpose. But it's going to have to go through some pressure in order to get to that point. I learned this while working on the wheel in the back corner of a pottery shop at the foot of the Shenandoah Valley in western Virginia. It was a spectacular place. Beautiful setting, beautiful scenery. I learned this about the pot which comes off the potter's wheel. The vessel is created for the potter or for others, but never for the vessel. The vessel serves no purpose unto the vessel. It wasn't intended for the vessel. I am not intended for me. Even though I live for me, I am not intended for me. I am intended for the potter or for somebody else. I learned this. The clay says nothing and the clay does nothing. It just sits there. <laughs> it remains silent while the potter works it over while the potter turns it and throws it and manipulates it and lifts it and it doesn't say no stop please it says nothing I believe if it could say it would say this make me make me make me whatever you want me to be just make me as Jesus Christ said not my will but thy will be done Jesus Christ, I, I, I learned this the other day, and this is a total side note, but in mentioning Jesus Christ and in thinking of the vessel that he was, he served as a vessel. You know, interestingly enough, God could not understand or have experienced suffering or tribulation or pressure. He's God, almighty, all powerful, but in the form of Jesus Christ, in the vessel of Jesus Christ, he experienced suffering and tribulation persecution, and pressure. I also learned this. The relationship between the potter and each and every lump of clay is clearly physical. It is a physical thing, but it is personal. And it is more spiritual than the eye can perceive. Watching my sister and my niece, and uh, I didn't get a chance to watch Alan, the master potterer, while I was there, Although he was cutting the bottoms of them afterward, you flip them up, you put them onto the machine, and you, you shape and cut the bottoms of them and whatnot with tools. But watching my sister, she has become quite a master potterer. And watching her spend time with each and every lump of clay, it was very physical to watch, but I'm, I realized this is a personal experience between her and that clay. It is personal between her and that lump. And it was very spiritual, very much so. Now, while also walking through the gallery at Blue Ridge Pottery in Standardsville, Virginia, if you ever make it over there, check them out. If you want to go online, I plugged them. Here we go. I want my royalties. <laughs> there is something that a vessel doesn't do. It doesn't compare itself against or amongst other vessels. As I'm walking through the gallery in the showcase in the, in the Blue Ridge Pottery, did it twice, double royalties, and... Uh, I'm looking at all the different vases and plates and bowls and just, he's got bird feeders. I mean, just a plethora of things going on there. But I never heard one of the other vessels say, did you see so-and-so over there? Did you notice the imperfections and flaws in that one? Look at that one's handles. No, it never said anything. It just sat there in all its glory, showing the potter's mastery. I thought, that's really interesting. Actually, it doesn't pick out the flaws or imperfections. It doesn't even focus or give a second thought of the differences between or amongst the other pots in itself. Well, it's shaped tall and thin and I'm short and stubby. And you, know, and you take the spiritual applications and in your spiritual walk, in your spiritual life, and you, you make the assessment and you judge yourself and esteem others higher than yourselves. I also notice this, something that the vessel doesn't do. It doesn't put itself in the showcase. The potter puts it there. I thought that was interesting. I said, none of these vessels ever walked up and put itself here on the shelf. The potter went through all his pottery and says, mm, mm, yeah, you're, you're beautiful and you're beautiful, but I need one to put out there. Yeah, you, you come here. And he puts it out there. The vessel didn't choose to be put out there. He allowed the potter to put it out there to bring glory to the potter, not to the pot. 
The pot is not up there on showcase to bring any glory unto itself, but to bring all the glory and honor to the potter. Uh, that's interesting. To put the potter's ability and power on display. Not the pot's. Not the pot's ability. Not the vessel's ability or reason for being fashioned and formed. Not its power, but the potter's. That is what each and every pot and vessel does. Is it showcases the potter's gifts and ability and power. The pot knows it's only there because the potter produced it and put it there. I also notice this, the pots, the vessels, it doesn't pick its purpose. It didn't get to choose to be what it wanted to be. It just said, make me. It doesn't choose what it will do or what it will become. It just trusts the potter to do the right things with it. A pitcher, a pot, a plate, a bedpan. It's a vessel. You can be a bedpan for Christ. Hey, there's worse things to be. What it is, is is because the potter made it thus. Be a pitcher. Be a plate. Be a bowl. Be a cup. Be a vase. Be a candlestick. Whatever the God has created and intended for you to be, figure it out and be it. That is your purpose for being here. That is why you're being molded and fashioned and formed. It conformed to the will of the potter and thus it acquired the will of the potter. I told you it's going to be super short. I'm already in my conclusion. I'm going to close with this. One of the most important things about the vessel is, not, is most certainly not its size. It's not its shape. It's not its color. It's not even the vessel or what the vessel does, but it's what the vessel possesses. See, in order for us to have drinking water, in order for that water to go from the faucet to my mouth, I need a vessel by which to put that precious commodity into. Back in the day, in order to get it from the well to the home, they had to have a bucket. Back in the day before that, to get it from the river to the village, they had to have a pot. Food, to transport it, to preserve it, to save it, whatever. It goes on and on. A bucket for the old coals, a bedpan for the waste product. Now there's maybe not so precious, but yet I still need to get that stuff out in a safe place and not in my home. I need a vessel by which to do that. The vessel is just a service tool. It is just a tool by which to carry, to hold, to pass forth the preciousness that is within it. Yeah, the vessel's beautiful. It was handmade, hand carved. I'm not here for me. I am here because I am a vessel. I am the home of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And that is my purpose today is to be a tabernacle for the Holy Ghost to dwell in it. Because it is the Holy Ghost that possesses the power to change lives. Amen. Not Jeremy Stewart. Amen. Well, dear brother, your testimony is great. Well, by the grace of God, it is such. But it is the Holy Ghost that speaks to the hearts of souls. And it needs a vessel by which it can travel about, by which it can communicate through. And I am that vessel. And Lord willing, I'll be that vessel in Denmark. And if I'm that vessel in Hastings, so be it. I'm okay with that. Make me. Thy will be done. See, as the ark on the top of the flood, it wasn't about the ark. It was what was in the ark. The continuance of life. Noah and his family. The basket in the river wasn't about the basket. It was about Moses, that he who was going to lead Israel out of Egypt. Right? The ark. The tabernacle, the camp. It wasn't about the camp. It was about the camp having the tabernacle. It wasn't about the tabernacle. It was about the tabernacle having the ark. The ark contained what? The precious things. The manger in the barn of a packed out inn. It wasn't about the manger. It was what was in the manger. The alabaster box. It's just a vessel. Just a box. But what was inside of that box is what really mattered. Isaiah 64. Plenty of time for a big old lunch today. Isaiah 64.
Let us read verses 6 and 7. But we are all as unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. You're familiar with that verse. Did you all know that that verse is in context and related with verse 8? And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou our potter, and we are all the work of thy hand. Our sins and iniquities do not take us off the wheel. You might, you might feel that way sometimes. You might get stuck in a rut. You might get battling with some thing that you just can't get the victory over. You get it, and then you lose it, and you get it, and you lose it. Whatever the case may be, guess what? As long as you are saved, <laughs> guess what? Once saved, oh, he's saved. You're on the potter's wheel. Your sins, your iniquities do not take you off the potter's wheel. I read here and I see iniquities. I see sins. I see them not conforming to what they're supposed to conform to, to being what they're supposed to be. But I still see them in verse 8 on the potter's wheel. For it is because of sin that is one of the reasons we are there. There's other things he's working and molding and shaping. But there's some things that he is also trying to work out, to lift out, to stretch out, to pull out. And the battle is real. The struggle is real. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Paul, thank his blessed heart, spoke of that in Romans and helps to explain that to us. Because there's been times where I've questioned myself. How could I think or speak or talk or do or go or want if I'm truly a Christian? Paul says, the struggle is real. Been there. I understand. Just keep trying to remain pliable and moldable. Get those things under the blood. Get them forgiven. And fulfill your purpose by which you were dug out of the earth for. He's working you over. And it's going to hurt. And there's going to be pressure. But there's also going to be water. And there will be nourishment. And there will be a tender hand supporting the pressure on the other side. It'll come from the inside. It'll come from the outside. It's going to come. It's inevitable. But it is also necessary. I am clay. You are clay. What will you be? What vessel will you wind up being? All kinds of glazes and colors and shapes and purposes. Multiple different purposes going on there. Multiple different types of pots and vessels. And that's perfectly the way it should be. For none of them are the same. Even though some of those look the same, each one has its own unique flair or touch or dimple or you name it. But we have a purpose. And you have a purpose. And it would do you and I and God a lot of glory and honor if we would figure out what that purpose is and remain pliable and moldable and willing on the potter's wheel. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the hour and the time that we have to be able to congregate together in your name because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Father, I cannot imagine life without you. I cannot imagine life without your book. I could not imagine life without church. I love coming to church. I love being with people. I love being with your people, God's people. And Lord, we are all vessels, unique in our own way, gifted in different areas, unlike one another, unique, different, special, peculiar. But we have a specific purpose. And Lord, I think there are those here this morning who have found out what that is, but they're still not off the potter's wheel. There's still work to be done. And then there's glazing and burning and firing and the whole gamut of things. Lord, we need your help to get through each and every stage and process necessary to wind up being vessels fit for the master's use. Perfectly formed and fashioned just for the master potter's hand. And Lord, we'll give you the greatest praise and glory for it now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.